Okay, so this lecture was about alterations in ventilation as well as elimination. So we basically talked about the respiratory system and a little bit about the urinary system. So some definitions here. Ventilation, this is just moving air into or out of the lungs. Diffusion, this is the process of basically exchanging gases, oxygen and CO2 across both the respiratory membrane and the cell membranes. Perfusion, this is the process of supplying oxygen to the tissues by forcing blood into a capillary bed. And then respiration, this is the uh, basically making energy from, from oxygen. We can respire without oxygen, but most of our energy is made using, using the oxygen that was delivered to the tissues. So this is just showing these gas exchange structures. So these bundles here, these are the alveolar sacs. Uh, the alveoli make up these alveolar sacs. Individually, they're called an alveolus. And like a net over these alveolar sacs, you have the capillary beds. And that's how we exchange gases. So oxygen goes from these alveoli into the blood. And CO2 goes from the blood into the alveoli so we can exhale it. So we talked about the jobs of each of these structures. Uh, the anatomy here. You know, I just kind of wanted to kind of get the ball rolling. Don't worry too much about this as far as the final exam is concerned. So ventilation includes both inspiration and expiration, breathing in and breathing out. And this is triggered by a number of receptors in the body, including receptors in the lungs, which kind of monitor the current state of, of breathing and will adjust that accordingly. There are also chemoreceptors, which detect uh, gas levels in the body. And this is based a lot on the partial pressures of these gases, as well as the pH, which makes sense because we know how gases like CO2 can affect the pH of blood. Inspiration, for the most part, this is the only way our cells obtain oxygen. Our body obtains oxygen. And then expiration, this allows us to rid our, our body of CO2 and um, excess water vapor. So diffusion... With diffusion, oxygen is trying to get into the cells. That's the goal. Get oxygen into the cells so the cells can use that oxygen to make energy. And then carbon dioxide is trying to get from the cells into the blood. And the rate of diffusion of these gases depends on their pressure, their partial pressure, which is basically the, the pressure exerted by a specific gas in a mixture of gases. So it depends on the partial pressure. It depends on how soluble they are. We know that oxygen is not very soluble in water. CO2 is more soluble in water. Um, and also the thickness of the membranes that these gases are traveling through, uh, the pH of blood, as well as temperature. So here are some of these structures. This is a really good image, I'm just kind of highlighting some of these things. So this is a cross-section of the alveoli, and there are different cells in here. So these guys here, these are macrophages. They're called alveolar dust cells, and they're going to basically consume pathogens that make their way down into the alveoli. We also have these uh, type 1 cells right here. These are the cells that are actually going to be involved with uh, gas exchange with the blood, which is this. So this would be a type 1 cell here. And this is the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane includes these type 1 cells, these epithelial cells of the alveoli, the endothelial cells of the capillary, and then there is a small basement membrane between these, between these cells. And that's the respiratory membrane. That's what these gases have to travel across. There's another type of cell here called a type 2 cell, and these type 2 cells produce surfactant. And I showed this on the board, but surfactant is going to decrease surface tension. Surface tension is just the, um, the attraction that water molecules have for each other. And when we decrease surface tension, it helps the alveoli to stay open. So then we talked about the transport of these gases, oxygen and CO2. Oxygen is not very soluble in water, so very little is found in plasma. But this is okay because we have hemoglobin. And hemoglobin contains four iron atoms. Each iron atom can hold one molecule of O2. So that's how we solve that problem. Instead of transporting oxygen in the plasma, we just transport it uh, via hemoglobin. Um, you know, when all of these iron atoms are carrying oxygen, we say that that hemoglobin molecule is fully saturated with oxygen. So the factors that affect the unloading of oxygen, so hemoglobin getting rid of oxygen, letting oxygen go, there are a couple of them. So 
If you have a low partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues, hemoglobin is going to unload more oxygen into the tissues. That makes sense. If you have more CO2 in the tissues, hemoglobin is going to unload more oxygen, which makes sense because if there's an increased amount of CO2, that's telling you that the metabolic demand is higher in that cell. Temperature, as temperature increases, um, hemoglobin is going to unload more oxygen. And also, as pH drops, the hemoglobin is going to unload more oxygen. And again, that makes sense. If there's a decrease in pH, that tells... Um, kind of tells the body that CO2 levels are probably rising or possibly rising. And if CO2 is up, again, increased metabolic demands, so more oxygen is unloaded. So the transport of carbon dioxide is a little more interesting. It's more soluble than oxygen, so you'll find around 10% dissolved in plasma. The rest of the CO2 is going to go into red blood cells, and 20% will bind to hemoglobin, not to iron. It binds to the uh, amino acid regions of hemoglobin, but the vast majority of CO2 is going to enter these red blood cells and undergo a chemical reaction, and this is the carbonic anhydrase reaction. So CO2 and water, in the presence of an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase, will form carbonic acid and bicarbonate. So basically what we're saying here is CO2 enters, most of the CO2 will enter red blood cells and become bicarbonate, which we know is a base. Um, as soon as that bicarbonate is made in these red blood cells, it leaves. It leaves the red blood cells and goes out into the, the plasma. And this is how it's carried to the lungs. However, since bicarbonate is an anion, when it leaves the red blood cell, we have to move something into the red blood cell, another anion. And we do that with chloride. It's called the chloride shift. Now, once this blood gets back to the lungs, these reactions are completely reversed. And CO2 is formed, and then CO2 is going to be exhaled, of course. This is really important reactions for the carbonic uh, acid bicarbonate buffer system. Carbonic acid is the weak acid, bicarbonate is the weak base, and this helps to buffer changes in pH in the blood. So some topics with impaired ventilation, abnormal breathing patterns. Normal breathing is known as eupnea, which is around 8 to 16 breaths per minute. And obviously changes could possibly indicate something, something's going on. Hypoventilation results in hypercapnia, which is um, too much CO2 in the blood. And then hyperventilation is, results in hypocapnia, too little CO2 in the blood. Which makes sense because if you're, not, if you're hypoventilating, you are keeping too much CO2 and therefore pH is going to drop with that increase in, in CO2 and vice versa for hyperventilation. Hypoxemia, this is reduced oxygen in arterial blood which is sounds similar but is different than hypoxia, which is reduced oxygen in the, in the cells. And then cyanosis, that's that bluish color that you see due to lack of oxygen. So cough, this is a reflex, and its job is to clear the airways. Changes in sputum, or the amount of sputum, consistency of sputum, if there's blood in the sputum, which is known as hemoptysis, that's, all of those things indicate some pulmonary pathology. Dyspnea, which is that feeling of shortness of breath, as well as orthopnea, which is that uh, shortness of breath while lying down. That's indicative of something like pulmonary edema, which you see in left-sided heart failure. And these are just all of these things kind of summed up here. So our first disease was pneumonia, which is an infection. It can be community-acquired or nosocomial. And this is going to cause inflammation in the distal airways. So the alveoli, uh, the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and even some of the interstitial tissue within the lungs itself. So it can be caused by basically any pathogen, bacteria, viruses, fungi, sometimes protozoa, and it's spread by aerosol droplets. Or if you are a natural reservoir for one of these pathogens, you can aspirate those into the lungs and they can set up shop and cause pneumonia. So just like any other immune response, you have uh, acute immune cells like neutrophils coming into the site, which will try to consume the bacteria. We're going to be concerned with bacterial pneumonia for, for, the, the, for this lecture. Neutrophils come in, they consume the bacteria, they die. That's where you get that exudate and that pus along with the, the leaky blood vessels from the inflammatory response. And um, as these immune cells accumulate and fibrin is activated, you have this characteristic consolidation that you see with, with lobar pneumonia. Clinical manifestations, productive cough, fever, shortness of breath, uh, chills, stabbing, pleuritic type chest pains, and then crackles when you listen with the stethoscope. Diagnosis, CBCs, HNP, 
x-ray, of course, um, and then sputum samples to identify the actual cause. As far as treatment, antibiotics, if it's a bacterial case, and any other supportive therapy. Macrolides are a good family of drugs, like the ZPAC azithromycin. Um, and here you can see some consolidation due to bacterial pneumonia. So common causative agents here, the number one causative agent in low bar pneumonia in adults is streptococcus pneumoniae. This is the same thing when you hear pneumococcal pneumonia. It's the same thing. That's what they're referring to. Okay, left out a U. So streptococcus pneumonia. There are certainly other pathogens that can cause pneumonia. Viruses can cause pneumonia. Fungi can cause pneumonia. Other bacterial pathogens. So there are many others, but streptococcus pneumonia is by far the most common in, uh, in adults. Then we talked about COPD, which is... Um, Kind of a catch-all term for diseases that are characterized by limitation in airflow. And typically caused by tobacco smoke. And historically, it's been classified as the combination between chronic bronchitis and emphysema. But also diseases like asthma, bronchitis by itself, chronic bronchitis by itself, emphysema by itself, all can be considered COPD. I like to think of it as the combination between bronchitis and emphysema because they are rarely separate. And then asthma, I think, is kind of in its own its own category. But nonetheless, you might hear those classified that way. So let's talk about each of these. So again, kind of one of the characteristics of all of these diseases that I mentioned is air can come in relatively easy. The problem is when the person goes to expire, these, these bronchial walls kind of collapse. And these people tend to produce a lot of mucus. And what happens is when these collapse and you have this mucus plug, this air just kind of twirls around and you can't get it out. So chronic bronchitis, the definition, hypersecretion of mucus, as well as a productive cough for at least three months per year for at least two consecutive years. Inhaled irritants are going to just cause this inflammation, which is bronchitis. And with any sort of irritation or inflammation, you produce mucus. Emphysema, what happens in emphysema is you basically, you know, I showed this in class where you have kind of this, these airways and you have these alveoli. The purpose of these alveoli being set up like this is to increase surface area for gas exchange. The problem is in emphysema, these just start to these walls between the um, alveoli start to break down. And all of these alveoli kind of coalesce into one stiff super alveolus. So these alveolar sacs just break down. And um, you really limit the amount of surface area for gas exchange. And also, uh, with emphysema, you have the, the breakdown of elastin, which kind of surrounds the alveoli. And that helps, to, that helps the alveoli to recoil. And when you lose that, again, these, these alveolar sacs become stiff and very inefficient. So you can see that here. This is normal, a normal alveolar sac. These are the walls between the alveoli. They start to break down. We also lose elastin, limiting that elastic recoil of the, of the alveoli. So asthma. Asthma is a very common pulmonary disease. It's a chronic disorder. Uh, basically what happens is there is hyper-responsiveness in the, the bronchi and the bronchioles. And when they're hyper-responsive, they constrict. And they also produce, there's also the production of mucus, of course. Remember, anytime you irritate smooth muscle, which as you can see, there's smooth muscle wrapped around these, these airways. Anytime they're irritated, no matter what the cause is, they're going to constrict. And that's what's happening here. And along with that irritation, you get the, um, the production of these mucus plugs. And unfortunately, in this case, this airway is cut off, and these are hyperinflated airways, and that's not good because these can, these can rupture. So clinical manifestations, wheezing, common cause of a chronic cough, increased respiratory rate, shortness of breath, treatment, 
beta agonists, which are going to increase sympathetic output like albuterol, inhaled corticosteroids like Advair, and of course anti-inflammatories, um, prednisone for, for acute type asthma attacks. Cystic fibrosis, this is a genetic disease. It's autosomal recessive, and it's due to a mutation in um, the CFTR gene, which is a chloride conducted channel in the membrane. And the problem with this is when you don't conduct chloride properly, you also don't conduct sodium. And when you don't conduct sodium, you don't conduct water. So what happens is you get this abnormally thick mucus that's produced. And this affects multiple organs, but the most severe manifestations occur in the lungs. That's why we talk about it here. So you get mucus plugs that form, and um, this mucus is very thick. It's hard to be cleared and it just kind of adheres to the epithelium because the cilia can't beat this um, this very thick mucus up and out. It's just too thick, it's too heavy. And uh, when it sits there, it really increases the chances of infection. So a lot of cystic fibrosis patients will, will die of infection. Clinical manifestations, cough, purulent sputum, especially if infection is present, increased respiratory rate, wheezing, um, clubbing of the fingers, and then there are other manifestations, systemic manifestations, but we're going to focus on, on the lungs. So as far as diagnosis and treatment, HNP genetic testing, again, this is autosomal recessive, so the parents either have to be affected or they have to be carriers for this. So uh, family history, of course, and a sweat test. So if the chloride concentration is too great, greater than 60 milliequivalents per liter, that's indicative of cystic fibrosis. So as far as treatment, you're trying to keep the airways as clear as possible. You're trying to break up that, that mucus. You want to treat infections. Uh, nutrition is really, really important um, because they have, they have a decreased ability to absorb nutrients because of these uh, conductance channels um, and also bronchodilators. Life expectancy is increasing, so it's around 30 to 40 years. Males live longer on average. Why that is, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, around 30 years ago, people didn't even make it out of their teens. So we are, we are um, making strides when it comes to cystic fibrosis. So this is just showing what's going on. So this is actually a mutation. It can be, there's a number of mutations actually, actually that can result in cystic fibrosis, but they all include, are all involved the CFTR gene, the chloride conductance channel. And this is on chromosome seven. And as you can see here, this is the channel. Okay, so this gene encodes for this protein, which is a chloride conductance channel. The problem is, since it's defective, chloride cannot be conducted across the membrane. And when chloride is not being conducted, that uh, not only um, stops sodium from being conducted, but actually pulls sodium into, into, um, into the cell. And with that, you have water moving into the cell. So all of this out here, where you want water and sodium so you can loosen up that mucus, it's not there. So you get that very thick mucus. Okay, so we, uh, we didn't have time to cover ARDS. And then we went into the urinary system. So the functions of the urinary system, regulation of body fluid, uh, volume, um, a lot of that's because of RAS, which we went over again, as well as body fluid composition, elimination of waste, things like urea and ammonia, um, synthesis, activation, and release of hormones like EPO, which is erythropoietin, which is necessary for the production of red blood cells. Renin, we all know what renin does. It cleaves angiotensinogen. Vitamin D, vitamin D actually, uh, the majority of it becomes fully activated in the kidneys. And then long-term blood pressure control is done by the kidneys. Of course, manifestations of changes in urinary function, pain, changes in urine volume or composition, uh, bleeding, nausea, vomiting, fever in the cases of infections. So, um, here is the, the, the general schematic of the urinary system. So, of course, there are two kidneys, there are two ureters, uh, the urinary bladder, and then the urethra. If we kind of look inside the kidney, we have these renal pyramids, which compose what's known as the renal medulla. And then you have this outer portion, which is um, composed of renal columns. The outer portion is the cortex. And... Um, 
at the ends of these renal these renal pyramids, you have the renal papilla, which drain into these minor calyces, which drain into major calyces, which will drain into the renal pelvis, into the ureters, so on and so forth. Okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to ask any of those anatomical questions um, unless they pertain to to the disease. So urine formation, um, the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And the nephron has two parts. It has a glomerulus and a renal tubule. I'm just going to go to this picture. So there are two parts. This, all of this, this is all nephron. And basically, the glomerulus and the renal tubule make up the nephron. Now, the glomerulus is just a very high-pressure capillary bed. And it is fed by an artery, an arterial, called the afferent arterial. And when this arterial blood comes in, it pushes fluid out, filtrate out, very high capillary hydrostatic pressure here. And when it pushes this fluid out, Bowman's capsule catches it. It's called filtrate. And that filtrate is just going to move through the rest of the renal tubule. The first part is the proximal convoluted tubule. The next part is the loop of Henle. And the final part is the distal convoluted tubule. And eventually, multiple nephrons will drain into this structure called the collecting duct or the collecting tubule. And basically, as this filtrate is moving along the renal tubule, stuff is being passed from the blood into the renal tubule, from the renal tubule to the blood, all the way until um, the body has taken back what it needs and gotten rid of what it, what it doesn't, and that will become um, part of the urine. So this is just showing where... Um, that the sites of transport are occurring for these different substances in the in the renal tubule. So we kind of went over it really quickly. I mean, you don't need to worry about the uh, elimination of urine. It's not really important for this exam. And then we talked about kidney stones. Kidney stones are calculi. The condition of having uh, kidney stones is called nephrolithiasis, or sometimes more vaguely called urolithiasis. The condition of having urinary stones. And these are just masses of salts that have become supersaturated and they've crystallized. Most of them are going to be calcium oxalate. But there are a, a number of other different types. Like there are uric acid stones, there are struvite stones, cysteine stones. There's a number of other types. But the most common is calcium oxalate. More common in med and um, risk factors, age 24 to 49, decreased fluid intake. I think that's probably one of the biggest, just not drinking enough water. Um, but also diet, if you have high calcium diet, that's been linked to, to kidney stones and decreased level of activity. So the pathophysiology, like I said, these salts, they start to supersaturate and they precipitate. When they precipitate, um, they start to crystallize. And, um, you know, along with all the risk factors on the last slide, having a UTI or other kidney diseases, other comorbidities like obesity and diabetes, but also genetic predisposition, all of these things can lead to the formation of kidney stones. As far as clinical manifestations, the, the big one is renal colic, which is that, uh, that kind of that flank pain that can change very quickly as the stone moves, or it can come on very suddenly. It may radiate to areas of like the groin. Uh, hematuria is not uncommon at all, so that could either be microscopic or it can be gross hematuria where you can actually see it. Nausea and vomiting, all of those are pretty common. As far as diagnosis and treatment, uh, presentation, 24-hour urinalysis, and then imaging to try to, you know, CT scans to try and see the stone. As far as treatment, pain management, increasing fluid intake, potassium citrate, which is a known inhibitor of, of kidney stone formation. And if they're too large, they may either be removed or broken into smaller uh, pieces with um, things like lithotripsy. This is just showing some of those different stones. And then our final disease was PKD, polycystic kidney disease. And this is when you have the growth of these cysts, um, both kidneys, in the kidneys, on the kidneys. And as they get worse and worse and worse, you gradually lose functional kidney tissue. Most, of, I want you to think of this as an inherited disease. Most of them are autosomal dominant, but there are, are autosomal recessive types. And again, what happens here is you have these cysts that get bigger, they become more numerous, and they just replace functional tissue. And uh, this causes pressure on um, 
the blood vessels in the kidneys, which I'll talk about in the next slide with how it activates RAS, but also decreases perfusion to the kidney tissue. And that's bad, obviously. Now, people can have different severities of this. They generally will always get worse, but some people get worse much more quickly where they are um, have complete loss of function by the time they're 40. Some people go and live a relatively normal life. So it really depends on the exact type um, as far as the severity of PKD. So clinical manifestations, hypertension, because this stimulates RAS. We talked about that. Flank pain, UTIs and kidney stone formation are very common, and also cysts of other organs. So since this is a mutation, it's not just in the kidney. So they'll have cysts on things like the liver, cysts on the, the pancreas. So these cysts are not confined to, to the kidneys. And those cysts on other organs can impair their function just like they impair the kidney function. So as far as diagnosis, based on the presence of three or more cysts uh, seen by ultrasound, also a family history and genetic testing can tell you if you have this, this disease. And um, the presence of these extra renal cysts, these cysts on other organs, that's a huge finding. As far as treatment, you know, just living a healthy lifestyle, supportive therapy, and um, end-stage renal disease care, um, like hemodialysis, at the, if it gets to that point. Again, not everybody reaches that point, but there's really no way, no matter what the severity is, there's no way to slow down the progression, no matter how fast or slow that progression is. So here are these cysts again. They're, they just completely consume these kidneys and um, replace that functional tissue. This is just showing um, how this damage affects the kidney disease and then, of course, hemodialysis. So that's going to wrap it up for me. Um, again, your exam will be, I sent all that, that information out, so it's 75 questions. Um, I sent you the topics. There won't be any surprises. All of the stuff from this lecture will obviously be new, but um, all of the topics will be the same that we've covered covered um, before. So just go by, go by those topics, and of course, if you have any questions, please let me know.